conversation I often have with educators when I ask about their leadership is I'll say, how is your principal? And a red flag answer for me is when they say, oh, they're great. They just let me do whatever I want. And I think, is that really a sign of great leadership? And I'm all for teacher autonomy. I think it's really important that we trust teachers in the classrooms to really be the experts of what they do. But it doesn't mean that they or we can't grow. And I think if we're in a position where we just have people let us do whatever we want and never provide mentorship, never push us to get better, it's not only bad for us, but it's actually bad for our kids. And as someone who craves mentorship, who craves the opportunity to learn and grow and develop, I know that I've left places because I felt I was becoming stagnant. And I think that's one of the worst things to happen is when you feel you can no longer grow. And that's why I was really intrigued by this conversation with Darina sackman Ebwa. She is absolutely incredible. I love this conversation. And she talked about this need for honest leadership, that sometimes the advice that we get from people that are above us in the chain of command of wherever we work, we might not like what they say in the moment, but it doesn't mean that sometimes they're not right. And sometimes it takes us a little while to catch on, to figure out, but do we get better because of it? And if we're not in a place where we're getting better, we're actually going backwards. I think that's really important to understand. And she does a great job of kind of clarifying that and why it helped her so much in her work. She is absolutely incredible. She took time out of her birthday. I'd love for you in the comments, first of all, subscribe on YouTube, but in the comments, if you could say happy birthday to her, I know that would mean the world. She's she's such a light in the world and just to have that feedback, you know, people saying happy birthday would, would make my day to bring that light to somebody else. And it really would mean a lot. But I know you're going to love this podcast episode. I absolutely loved it. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I have, can I say this? My friend? Can I say my yeah. friend? Can I say You've my friend? Me. We've like become friends, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, we've yeah. become friends and uh, and neighborly friends because we live in the same state, so we're pretty close. So Darina sackman Ebwa is here today and is such an accomplished educator. Uh, it was Florida Teacher of the Year, uh, one of the national finalists for Teacher of the Year in the entire us of a right is that what we say or you say you guys i don't know whatever i'm not i just that's pretty big big country right so absolutely amazing teacher uh is a very accomplished speaker people everyone that i connect to that knows you thinks like you are just just awesome just loves you and you push people to get better they can see that they can get better and i feel just invigorated. And not only is she here today spending time with me, she's spending time with me on her birthday, which is amazing. So you're in the comments. I've been people asking to comment, say happy birthday to Darina. That would make her day. So uh, I love it. Darina, welcome to the podcast. I'm so, just so love getting to know you. If you could just introduce yourself to everybody, tell us who you are, what you do today. I think it's a great place to start. Hey, everybody. Hi, it's my birthday. I'm 29 again. <laughs> but uh, no, my name is Darina Sagman Ebwa, and I am just a te- uh, not just a teacher. We should never say that. But I am just su- super excited to be here and I've uh, been teaching since, oh, gosh, a long time ago, 1998 in Massachusetts, overseas. And then I moved to Florida, like ever the New Yorker, we took over the state and uh, wound up um, being in Orlando, loving life and being a teacher there for all other kids. My specialty is English language acquisition, bilingual education, as well as working with students with, um, which I call varying exceptionalities, A-C-C-E-P-T, so that we can accept all children as they are. And then just things just happened. And I started to uh, branch off after people were saying, you know what, you've got a lot to say and took that plunge and got nervous because should I leave the classroom or not? Well, I left the classroom to go inspire other classrooms and other teachers in the classroom across the country. And now the world, I'm now international. So I'm really excited about that. So thanks for having me. I got to ask you this question because it it is really like, you know, I hear about it sometimes too. And I'm just, there is something that is really so evident with you that I find just you love teaching like you like I can just feel like when you talk about it when you share practices 
but you also you also left the classroom and doing this stuff. It's like, oh, you like like how was that transition? And does it mean you like? Does it mean you're like, yeah, but I was sick of it? Like, what does that mean? Because I think a lot of people feel that once you leave the classroom, it's like you no longer love teaching. And I think that's totally wrong. And I, I guarantee there's some people that are like, I'm out, like I'm doing anything yes. else. But yes. that's not something I feel with you at all, right? I feel that you have this love, this passion, and you want to truly help educators not only become better, but find that love that you have. Like, am I wrong there? Like, how do you see that? Because I, I, like, I, I feel that how much you love teaching just in the conversation with you. And it's absolutely, it's, it's infectious for sure. Thank you for that. Yeah. It is the greatest profession on the freaking planet. Can, can I say freaking on this podcast? Is that all right? Yes. In, Texas, in, in Texas, in a specific district, I was not allowed to say freaking because it, <laughs> it alludes to something else. So I needed to make sure that <laughs> right. this was it. I got you. Yes. I just, I, there is, it is the greatest profession. And I know that we're going through a lot, but, but as a teacher right now in public education, any education at this point, but mm. yeah, the passion to be in front of children, I, I will get a little of a clamps to talk amongst yourselves, but I do get a little emotional about it because I love this profession so much. I want to preserve public education yeah. and I want teachers to realize, how, yeah, I'm getting all, look at me, I'm getting all weird. How amazing it is you don't realize the gift you have to be in front of children and you don't realize the gift you have to be amongst children and this right. camaraderie and this collective agency of people coming together to educate children, which in turn will have children with better lives through education, through mentorship, through mm -hmm. believing in them, through high achievement, but also meeting the children where they are plus one. And this ability to do that in a setting for seven hours a day, as tired as it can be, mm -hmm. but finding the strategies to reach each child individually but then finding yourself within that process and saying, what can I do to better children in turn the community, but myself as a leader, that's what it is. And then to make that decision to leave was simply because people kept on saying the impact you make 120 kids every year for the past 15, 16 years is great. But now the impact you can make for thousands based on what you offer that works. So go out, go forth, go, go. So I was literally pushed out of the nest. Uh and instead of me going, no, but I want to stay. And that's what made me say, okay. And I'm still now close to the kids from 2013, mm -hmm. 2014, and 2015, who I'm not even a godmother to some of the kids and just, just traveled with some of the kids and went mm -hmm. back to their home countries because the relationships, the empathy, the compassion, but also the TLC squared, tender love and care and tough love culture. That's the stuff that made me say, I got to share this with other people. And I call myself a, a Ralph Lauren teacher. Okay. You know how Ralph Lauren throughout the eighties, I mean, it was started in what, right. 60 somewhere, but then 83 got really big. It's still considered like educational philosophies are classic, but they've modernized, but still right. stayed classic where it doesn't go out of style. I'd like to say what I did back then still works, but I still enhance right. it with just a few things to modernize, to meet the needs of the 21st century kid now in 2023. And that's kind of how I think it's working. And it is because I'm also listening to the needs of the teachers and the students of 2023. Okay. I love that. It's Cause I am like the most, like, I always say a little bit boring dresser, but if you look at pictures of me 10 years ago, I'm not wearing stuff. You're like, what were you wearing? <laughs> right. I kind of wear the same stuff now too, but like with a little tweaks, a little differences here or there. I love that, that analogy that, that hit home for my fashion self. So yeah. I, that was a good one. I like Thank that you. one. Thanks a lot. But you know, it, it's, it's funny that that privilege that we have to work with kids. Yeah. When uh, somebody said to me, when I want to become an administrator, they're like, aren't you going to miss the kids? I'm like, no, because I'm going to be around them all the time. So I like, why would I miss the kids? Like, don't I, and, and I would be in classrooms all the time. In fact, I'd find myself sometimes, and this is a reality of administration. You have to do crappy paperwork and blah, 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 and fill this report out and stuff like that. And I was just like, oh my God, I can't do this anymore. And I would just get up in my office and I would like Billy Madison in a kindergarten class and just sit in the <laughs> middle of them. And it would just like fill me up with energy. And it was just, it was so awesome. Right. And it's like, you know, like, Hey, Mr. Crows, you have a zit. Right. And it's just like, yes, I do. And I love that you just said it like that. And so <laughs> like, I've already felt self-conscious, but you know, and it's just so innocent and so sweet and love. And one of the things I've been saying, and, and I know you're going to appreciate this 
I'm like a big advocate that kids can change the world. I really believe this, but I believe that they change the world by being kids. Because like, if you, anytime I show videos of my own kids, the room lights up. Just kids being kids is actually what changed the world. Not necessarily throwing adult problems on them. I think that's something I struggle with is like, let them be kids. We like, let them be kids. Cause that actually is infectious. Right. And, and I think a little, you and me are a little bit like, let's not grow up. Like I can feel that too, because there's no better time to be a kid. And just, it just, I, I just love that enthusiasm for, ha for students. And I, you, you said this in the last podcast, I'm, I'm curious your thought. You talked about this notion of honest leadership. Yeah. When you talked about that, what did you mean by that? Cause I know that the, when you, you kind of briefly touched on it, I know it's going to resonate with a lot of people. What did you mean by that? Cause I think it's something that's desperately needed in education right now. Yeah. Well, honest leadership and authenticity all the way, you know, we, we are having a little bit of a challenge from teacher shortages, from what's happening with public education, but also with leadership short shortages as well. But honest leadership just simply just means that that principal can show their vulnerability in within their leadership you are, you become a principal, right? You are groomed to be, and there's different processes to become a principal in various districts, various countries, right? And, but we'll say in schools and states, but when you become these principals, you kind of lose yourself along with it. But as you're becoming that principal and growing into leadership, you should be honest about that mm -hmm. because we're all growing with you at the same time. But the honesty is also keeping it real within the teachers as well. And creating those norms and that culture in that school environment, anywhere from the front room when they're saying hello to you and the staff and how they should be in interacting with parents to how we should be interacting with kids and making sure administration is truly in the classrooms the way you just described. Because right. there's a lot, there's a lot of teachers that might just go, administrators that go in just for evaluations and barely from the time, right, frame also. We can't blame mm -hmm. them 100%, right? But the honest, the whole point of leadership is you are keeping it real. Mm -hmm. Everyone can see through it. And if you have through the lens of appreciative inquiry, through the lens of positivity, without it being toxic, that I have no time for. I have no time for po toxic positivity, which is very you're, different. You're, you're the best. I love yeah. you. And yeah. I have no time for exploitative empathy either. Yeah. Like, hey, yeah. this is great. It's Taco Tuesday. Here's some tacos. <laughs> no, let me go Wednesday with the kids on that early day. That's right. what I need. That's the honest conversations, doing surveys and learning and growing from them. Having a leadership team where you are listening. Okay, now there's only so much you can do because unfortunately education, as Catherine Bassett, a good friend of mine has said, it should be more lattice than ladder. And mm -hmm. so it should be leadership of lattice where we're all, think about the way plants grow on the lattice. Think the way mathematics works. We all should be in lattice, not this way, but still it's still a top-down thing where mm -hmm. administrators still have to hear from these individuals up here in the ivory tower. If only we were this way, teachers who, excuse me, um, honest leadership who use lattice over ladder are the classrooms that are more comfortable, that you see better growth, you mm -hmm. see better teachers, you see more retention, and you see an environment where people go, oh my gosh, I love coming to work every day. Yeah. And it takes time though. You have to you have to be really, really look inside yourself as a leader to see, are you willing to do that? Well, they, you, you know, so I know you saw me speak and I, I mentioned about, and this is, this is true. It, every, you can, there's a lot of things that could be said about me when I was a principal of my staff, I'm sure, but they would never say I didn't care about kids. They would, nobody would say that, right? They could tell that right away. And I would always talk about how every morning I'd be greeting kids. At the end of the day, I'd be saying goodbye to them. I'd be outside. I'd go into classrooms every single day. I would go in those classrooms. And this is what I, and I know you, you saw this. I watch when I say that and I look at teachers, look at each other and like, I wish my principal would do that. Like they're fr so frustrated that they're like, why, why is that not happening in our school? Right. And we like, there's all these. So basically this is what you knew. If I didn't show up in your classroom that day, I wasn't in the building. I was out doing something else. Cause if I was in the building, I'd see me in your classroom. And part of it too was because when administrators show up, it, it is like change the dynamic of the room and people like get all like nervous and they start acting different because it's such a rare occasion and they think they're in crap. So I was in your room all the time. So you were just normalized to it. It was just such a normal thing that you just kept doing what you were doing, right? It wasn't like, oh my God, the principal's here. And I think that's a, one of the big issues that's caused because I, I actually just shared this yesterday. I said, if you are making decisions that impact the classrooms, you have to be in the classrooms. Like that is so, and it, it's like, <laughs> you did, and I'm like, 
How is that? You just did it. You're like, yeah, that's common sense. How is that not common sense to me? And I think a lot of times um, there is a quote I read uh, from, I, I told you to get this book, Unreasonable Hospitality. It said, huh. basically said, um, basically out, people outside of organizations have all the authority, but none of the knowledge and people inside the, in, in the space as closest to people have all the knowledge and none of the authority. So you wanted to, you know, kind of have that. So I, I love that because I tried to be that. And, and as you said, I think people gave me a lot of leeway because they saw me around kids. They're like, Hey, I know he's new. He's young. He probably has none of this, but I know his heart's in the right place. So we're going to give him some grace. Whereas if I was making bad decisions, but never around kids, good luck. Like you're in trouble, right? And there, there you just completely solidified the importance of the emotional intelligence of the leader itself. And I think that, you know, principals might be hearing this and going, yeah, well, thanks a lot. I don't have enough time because of this and this and this and this. Wait a second. Just like you said, all this paperwork, I got to get up and go into a classroom for a kid to tell me there's a zit on my face. Thanks a lot, kid. Right. <laughs> Those are the things that you look for. Right. The, the, and the, what you just said is show up. You show up to show up. When you show up, you showed up. And I'm not well, saying the physical aspect of showing up, but like, come on, show up for these teachers and go there and let them see it. If you're not in the classroom and the last time a school that I serve, they haven't, the principal due to other circumstances and, you know, not having a lot of teachers, uh, having a teacher shortage, they say it's difficult for the teacher, the principal to go in there. I disagree. And my constructive feedback through the lens of appreciative inquiry was what are you doing to say the, to support the other people? Because, well, I want to give them autonomy. If it's nothing's wrong, that's not the culture you're creating. Right. Autonomy is one thing. What you're doing is saying, I'm letting them do whatever they want to do. And I, they're new teachers. They're green. You got to figure out, right. they want to know what they're doing. You need to go in there and mentor. Well, I don't have time because of all that. This is where you as a leader were successful because you made that balance of saying, I got to get in there. Most majority are there for the te for the students. But if you're going to use the buzzwords of what's sexy in education for this for the next two years, and it's in the interest of children or <laughs> using the buzzwords of equity and a checkbox rather than the reality yeah. of what equity is, using SEL for the checkbox rather than what really the embedded em empathy and compassion of teaching children on an everyday basis is. That's the stuff of what I'm talking about with true leadership and honest leadership is show up for those teachers. Well, show so up. And so that, that actually, when you talk about, um, the, the, like, I don't have time for this, that's actually a lie. And because they, they're not understanding that if I spend time in the classrooms, all of a sudden they're like, uh, Covey stuff, speed of trust, all of a sudden the, like an hour long conversation turns into a couple of minutes because we have trust bills, right? You see me all the time. The re one of the biggest reasons I was always out at recess is because tough conversations, like a lot of the community conversations, a lot of the and I'm being honest here, a lot of the it, the issues of mistrust that is happening in communities across North America could have been solved by being outside in, in the morning, talking to family members, talking to communities and stuff like that. Cause then you're having some of these good conversations, but it's like, you know, and then you're, you're actually, so the time you invest in that is going to actually come back to you. I, I, I truly believe that you'll, you'll save time later but it's, it's the upfront cost that people are scared about because what if it doesn't? Well, you know, at least we kind of built that trust. And like one of the things that, and you'll, I know you're going to appreciate this just because I can tell by your personality. If I, I always do this little thing and I ask teachers like, Hey, how's your principal? Oh, they're awesome. They let me do whatever I want. I'm like, does that make them awesome? Right? <laughs> does that make them awesome? So you just do whatever you want. Like, are you, so it doesn't, they don't ever come in, talk, help you get better. They just let you do whatever you want. And, that, you know, I think sometimes that's a little bit of a warning. The other warning sign is like, oh, they're really nice. <laughs> when I was like, oh, yeah. like they're nice, but you know, I wouldn't want them in charge of anything. Do you yes. know what I mean? So that to me, like that kind of reaffirmed that. Now you talk a lot of, um, obviously you work with organizations internationally and that's awesome. And, and doing uh, multilingual English, you know, ELL work. T tell me a little bit, tell me a little bit about that work. And cause I think a lot of people think that's a very specialized thing, but I actually think it's should be kind of like the things that you do or should be everywhere. Is that fair to say? 
it is with the understanding of that the the big the big issue of not being trained or understanding the difference of English language acquisition as opposed to putting um, you know the strategies that are used for ELL as opposed to, oh we can use that for ESE sorry for all the okay. acronyms because I'm anti acronym but that's okay. okay. Right. But you have ESE, ELL, you know, you have all, all the children, SPED, 401k, 503c, I don't know, whatever those acronyms are that kids use. Right. OPP, you know, you know all that stuff. Well, with their 504 <laughs> plans. I, I don't even know. We sound like California. My, you didn't catch my joke. You didn't catch my joke. OPP. What did you say? I said, you know, like OPP. <laughs> yeah, you know me. Oh, yeah, all right. All right. <laughs> That's the next joke. There, there you go. Sorry about that. <laughs> There's a delay on the farm. Sorry about that one. I missed that. But um, yeah, <laughs> but with English learners, as long as teachers, when they walk in and they see their roster, my biggest thing that I tell people all the time, roster equals responsibility. And when a child is in your room and you see the little globe on your roster digitally and it drops down and it says ELL or ML, multilingual learner, and the globe is there, you're just going, oh man, but I don't speak Spanish, right? It's that automatic fossilized ideology that one, you have to speak the language of the child, which is completely the opposite. Okay. And the other is just, oh, what am I supposed to do? I don't know what I do. I got 60 hours of ELL endorsement. Right. So what the important thing is, is that one roster equals responsibility. And two, the strategies used will influence and help other students. Yes. But as long as you understand it's coming from a linguistic standpoint, the strategy you use, oh, it's good for our ESE kids too. Putting those two together is a, to me, I will nip that in the bud immediately. Stop doing it. What you have to do is saying, wow, this strategy for an English learner is excellent for them to acquire the language. I must remember that this is a language situation, not a cognitive or not something that deals with the child's student with varying exceptionalities, right? ACC, APT. Mm -hmm. So that is very different. Although the strategy might be similar, one is linguistic and the other one might be more cognitive. Right. And that separate right there. Sure. Use similar strategy with the increased rigor. But once you see that difference, you'll notice that that strategy will differentiate itself as you're working with the kids. And so that's the first thing that I have to let people know, because oh, she's just an ELL teacher that it works with all kids, all these strategies. Well, I'm constantly told it's not rigorous enough for ca scaffolding the stuff. Hmm. No, studying children and where they are linguistically through those assessments that you get in each district in each state that varies. A lot of people use WIDA or ELPA or all these other tests and analyzing that data. That's the tough love part. And yeah. seeing where they are in listening, speaking, reading and writing drives my instruction of what I'm doing every day for that kid to push them a little bit more. All children can benefit from knowing what they're doing in listening, reading, speaking, and writing of the English language nowadays in 2023, mm -hmm. right? But the importance is that, okay, if this child's really good in listening and speaking, but is really low in the, in the reading, then I know that he's going to have to do a much more reading in the classroom than he is going to be listening because he's overcompensating for the fact that he can't, which creates mm -hmm. long-term English language learners. So the analysis of data to understand English learners and mentoring teachers to do that will then help them with the student excel and then be really engaged in the classroom, not knowing that information and then just, you know, no man's land student, you know, teacher centered and then teaching all the kids, putting baby in a corner and then putting Google Translate right. is not going to work for any of those kids. So as you can see, I'm kind of jumping on a soapbox, which I apologize, but it is one of the groups right. of children that if you work on one, if you really get, if I'm going to get from a principal standpoint, we understand people want their numbers to go up. Guess what? Focus on these kids principles and your numbers will go up. Focus on these kids and your environment of love and empathy and compassion for children right. will go up. Focus on all of that. And you will be able to see that these strategies, wow, this works really well linguistically. Let me go see if that can work for this child in my, um, you know, non-inclusive uh, ESE class that I have to, you know, put, uh, outside of the classroom for a minute when they take out the babies and they work with the kids on their own. Mm -hmm. Wow, this actually worked. Indiv this is great. All of that is a domino effect by becoming more and well-versed in English language learning strategies and acquisition of the, of the language itself. So that's just me. I'll just step back it. a little passionate. No, Sorry. I love it. I love it. I love it. This, you know, obviously you have such a tremendous knowledge just of, of the, obviously this area, but all of teaching and, um, I, I know people know this about you and I know it's something you're, uh, you should be proud of that you were a Florida teacher of the year, which is such an incredible accomplishment and such a big state. 
I don't know if that matters, right? Like, it's not like there's like only seven teachers here, right? So it's a huge deal. How do you see kind of, because not only were you that, you were, I think you were a top four finalist nationally too, right? Which is absolutely incredible. How, how did you see the work that you did at your school and the impact of other colleagues through your practice leading you to that? Because I, I don't think we ever do that on our own. Well, right. I know I've never done it on my own because I've never been recognized for anything. So, so I can say for sure I've never done that on my own. But like I, I would actually say, and I just know it's not just leadership. Like I think le when we talk about leadership, we're not just talking about admin. We're talking about, you know, people across the hallway that make an impact. How did you see like, you know, the teachers across the hall making an impact on you as you were getting that recognition? Uh, as I was getting the recognition, yeah. I'm not sure about the getting the recognition, but first I have yeah. to just go back for a second. Yeah, you were one of the top five um, in education books on Amazon, by the way. You were once number one, so you do get an accolade right. for your books, right. by the way. So right. just so you know, I'll go back to this. Just, this is about you. This is about I you. Know, just, just wanted you to know how I, I think your books are fabulous. But besides that, um, moving on. The teacher of the year thing was um, because your colleagues choose you for that school, right? Okay. And one of the reasons is, you know, some people say, oh, it's a popularity contest and you have to write this huge journal or this and that. And there's a theme every year and all this different stuff. I went with it with the understanding of I'm going to write about why this is working for my kids. And if people see these essays that I'm writing to be a Florida teacher of the year, I'm going to be a Florida teacher of the year that is a conduit that's representing Florida teachers so that I can go around because the Kristen McAuliffe um, mm -hmm. ambassador to education, you leave that year and travel the state and represent mm -hmm. the state elsewhere. Well, then my job was to, if this is working, my numbers look good, but my edu my students, um, they come to school, they feel safe, they feel happy, but I'm not seeing that other places. Maybe I can inspire them to do that. That's why I wrote the essays that I did. Mm -hmm. That's why I continued to do what I did. You know, it's not the competition. It's actually the collective understanding right. of what we can do to inspire, empower, motivate others to say, what can I do in the classroom? What I did notice when I was at Westridge Middle when this happened, which is still a fantastic school in Orange County, um, Westridge Middle, was that they saw that the kids, what I did in the classrooms, and they saw that they were learning, they did not put the baby in the corner. They realized that even though I might not speak Swahili, even though I might not speak Hindi, even though I might not speak Portuguese or Spanish, mm -hmm that I'm gonna put these students where she told me, front and center, not next to a child that speaks the same language and get that child with the TLC squared. If they can do it in Sackman's class, they can do it in my class. So the, again, ripple effect of success in my class of children where English is not their heritage language mm -hmm. inspired them to go, well, then they're gonna be able to do it in math. Then to give them statistics of children who come from Saudi, children who come from other countries like Bosnia, where their eighth grade mathematics is really our 12th grade, they should be in honors classes and push it, even though that honors teacher is like, no, this, I don't speak Bosnian. You don't do that. You say, but you speak math. Yeah. So to push them has inspired them to say, my God, they're the number one kids in the class. I have, I have lowered the stigma of what a non-English speaker, which I don't like saying that, but that's what they mm. think. And then I let them realize that English doesn't have to do with it, right? That's just the barrier they need to come over to get to the content. And like you and I had this discussion, if the kid masters the standard, it doesn't right. matter if they got the homework right. They right. know the standard. Right. So they get the grade. We had that conversation ad nauseum. Yep. Yeah. So if they had that concept, I actually helped change how people saw how to grade an English learner equitably, not to use that buzzy. So that's the change I wanted to see in the world of education. And that was the reason I felt people were like, yeah, you're changing the perspectives of other teachers to benefit. So the children will benefit from that and excel. And that is what makes a great teacher. This, this is a, so I wrote about this concept in Innovate. Uh, innovators mindset called competitive collaboration. And you just gave a masterclass on that because I am, I think, I think we're, I think we're such a, so focused on collaboration that it's like competition's evil. I'm like, mm, no, competition's not bad. It actually pushes me, you know, I want to be the best I can be. And, and so when I talk about the notion of competitive collaboration, it's like, if I see things going on in other classrooms, I'm like, well, there the kids love that. I gotta, I gotta pick it up. I gotta get better. 
can I go across to that teacher and say like, Hey, how are you doing that? Right? Like there should be that, that kind of that push pull kind of going on. And I, so I, I, I love that because that's such a great example of what you did. All right. So this is actually coming out, um, in, in the last couple months of the school year. And I know people are so motivated when they listen to you. So as people finish out the year, what would be your best piece of advice for them to finish strong? Oof. We all are exhausted. We all are saying we're counting down to the days. Count mm -hmm. up. Don't count down. Don't put the days up. Don't start putting your stuff away from the board unless it's overly done because Pinterest is not pedagogy and STEM doesn't come in a bin. <laughs> but you want to make sure that, you know, oh, if your room is kind of overly done, you can calm it down a little. But don't start packing up. Don't start doing that. It's it, no, you don't leave. You don't, don't start cleaning up the party before the party's over. And you want to actually lean up towards the, the, the summer break. You don't want to lean down to it. Um, and so when you, when you actually count up instead of count down physically, mentally, emotionally, you actually get excited. Um, again, stop. I know you you want to get out as soon as post planning happens. You don't want to do that. You want to give every moment that you possibly can. How you do that is that after testing, we all know it. It can get lackadaisical. We need to really focus because that's where the true artwork of teaching happens. Mm -hmm. So I challenge anybody after that testing, the rigor should still be there, but the artistic way of teaching, including those standards, is where now you can shine. This is where I want to challenge everybody to say, how can I teach math in the way I really wanted to before my scope and sequence? <laughs> because now that the testing's over, what else can I do? I know some of you have EOCs, but can you add that magic of what you do along there? Challenge yourself to do that rather than go, testing is over, I'm done, I'm wearing slides and sweats and I'm going to class, right? Don't, right? right. These are the things that you have to say to yourself, how can I use this artistic moment? I now have the freedom to truly be the teacher I've always wanted to be uh, in these next 44 days, right? And I know I sound like Joey Bag of Donuts when I say that, but I'm serious. It's the time to shine as a teacher. And exactly what you said, dopamine is a beautiful thing when it's done with a little bit of competition. So perhaps mm -hmm. maybe read that book and see that you see that you have that competitive mm -hmm. collaboration and at the end of these last nine weeks, the last nine weeks coming up, perhaps there is some academic and collective competition that you could have in order to keep that momentum going with that rigor, which is the plus one, and ease down into it. Because just like when you work out, do you go, workout's done? Or do you actually slow down and do your warm down? You can still do your warm down, but your heartbeat is still up. You're still working and you're still burning calories. That's awesome. I love that. You know, we years ago, um, you, you know, before winter break, it's like all oh, the kids, they just want to get out of here. I'm like, this is it just the kids? This is just the kids? <laughs> kind of everybody. I get it. And so, you know, like it seemed like kids would check out, a lot of teachers would check out. We started doing this thing right before that winter break uh, called Innovation Week, where we actually said, here, hey, figure out a problem you want to solve. We're going to give you a week to solve it. We're going to take this time. I have never seen so many kids so excited about school especially at that time of year and it was it was like super high for any time of year but it was the last week because they 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 saw these kids saw they were inventors they saw they were innovators and we got to do things that were just so exciting and that got them excited to learn over the break for themselves right and i think the biggest thing and i know this is something you do very very well you kind of create that spark where people want to learn after. And I always say that if the T if the kid needs you after they leave, you haven't done your job, you got to get them excited about that learning. So I know you do that so beautifully. I have loved talking to you and I know everyone's <laughs> going to love you. If you never talk to me yet, I'm going to be livid with you. You're stuck so, with me now. We you're met stuck with and me now, now you're stuck with me. <laughs> you're stuck with me now. So yeah, everyone, if you can follow Jarena, she is such an inspiring person. I absolutely just, I adore you. Can I say that? I adore you. I think you're just wonderful. And I know people, um, I just hope this podcast gets out to a bunch of people who, who don't know you and will be just as obsessed as I am now. You're incredible. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. And don't forget, Believe stands for Be the Educators Who Lead to Inspire and Empower Via Empathy. And you showed that to me today. So honestly, George, thank I you for everything. You. I love you. You're the best. Anyways, make sure you follow Darina. Thanks for being here. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>